I, I know in assigning myself this spot that I am pressing people's weekends, and I won't do it for very long. I have some thanks to say, and I have a couple of remarks I want to offer about what it was that we all just went through together. Um, I, 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 I am, uh, in thanking the people I work with, I'm, I'm really uh, more than usually thanking the people who literally made this possible. I, um, I have been dealing with a, a tiny little difficulty. My mother uh, died uh, two weeks ago yesterday, and um, the team whom I usually count upon to get things done uh, was the team that made it all possible while I stepped away to deal with the inevitabilities of life and death. So my thanks are not merely the routine matter that one might have watched me give in the past. They are the thanks for the people who saved this from disappearing as I disappeared myself. Uh, to Daniel Ganuchev, who has uh, produced the stream, the video, will produce the audio, the transcript, has in fact coped successfully with everything except my bad microphone placement all day long without a single error. I am, as always, in awe of what uh, an, an, an empowered geek can do. Uh, to Michael Weeholt, uh, my personal assistant who has uh, done everything that was necessary to get all the logistics straightened out and everything on point and all of it without the over-pervading and, in fact, overwhelmingly unnecessary intervention of his boss, my, my special thanks. Uh, to the volunteers uh, who worked with him to produce a perfect conference being driven by a man insane with grief and totally incapable of operating also, my thanks. Um, Tanisha Madrid has run uh, my businesses now uh, for more than uh, six years, having been, uh, well, I'm sorry, so say it yourself. Correct my numbers, that's her job. Um, Tanisha has uh, made it possible for me uh, to remain in business when I didn't actually know what my bank balance was because she knew it for me. Um, we have worked together so long that I wonder whether I can run a business without her, but one of these days, I suppose, I'll have to try. Thank you from my heart. Um, when, when you're in trouble, when you're struggling in law practice, you are at risk of being absolutely destroyed because lawyers work under rules of strict liability. If we screw up, that's the end of us. Um, that's when uh, the quality of your partner is the only thing that keeps you. Uh, in business. Um, it's an honor uh, for me to work with Mishi, and uh, it's an extraordinary privilege for any lawyer to have a partner uh, who is perfect uh, at all the things that one is imperfect at oneself. Uh, I have been imperfect at everything recently, and she has been perfect at everything. She made this conference program. She got all the people in order. She made it occur, and I don't have any appropriate way to express my gratitude to Keith Bergelt and the Open Invention Network for providing lunch. I can express my gratitude adequately. It was an excellent lunch. I hope you enjoyed it. I'm really grateful to OIN, as, also, as always, for paying for it. The donors to SFLC, whom you see in this room and whom you all know, the companies that have shared the wealth with us for 13 years now so that we could provide lawyering to the community and so that we could train lawyers who work there now. Um, uh, well, what's to be said except that they have stepped up and made community possible in ways which, uh, well, I found them an awful lot of fun. So much then for thanks. I, I want to say a little bit about substance before we all part for another year. Uh, you see, I hope, what it was that I intended us to be talking about, which the news that has been accumulating over the weeks that I have been away uh, has very much intensified. We have come to the end of that first phase of the life of the free software movement and the open source temperament. We have taken our bow for that. We changed how everybody in the world made software, and they're not going back to making it a different way. 
we have created an understanding that sharing is better than excluding in a whole variety of technical phases, and that has changed how every company works in the world, because everybody's IT is different. And we have changed the way careers work in IT, because we have altered the social contract of employment. We have given young people around the world who were learning an opportunity to cut their teeth on the real and to prove their value to employers and to societies and to educational institutions by getting their hands into the real stuff and making it better. There is no impulse to learning quite as extraordinary as the impulse to learning that comes from being able to change what is for the benefit of the people around you. And from the moment we first began to survey open source programmers in the mid-90s, we learned again and again in every survey of people what a powerful motive it was to help the people around me, to improve my skills while making life better for others. We did that in the making of computer programs and the technology that computer programs enable. And we changed millions of people's lives for the better in that process. We did that against the background of some resistance. People who thought we shouldn't do it that way because it was wrong for their business models or because it was wrong for the status that they had in the world of cutthroat competition among firms because they thought it was not an appropriate social model because it was un-American or un-this or un-that. And there are no such people left. Not because they're dead, not because they were run over by Joseph Schumpeter's creative destruction of capitalism. They're just as rich as they used to be, but they're our friends now. They came to, well, I'm going to call it enlightenment, if you don't mind. Because it was an enlightening experience for all of us to see that sharing worked so much better than excluding. There was lawyer's work in this. Sharing has rules. And, and the minimalist rules of sharing work very well, but they don't work completely well. And the more complex rules of sharing, in which I spent most of my grown-up career as a lawyer and a law teacher, those, those rules of sharing had difficulties. They were cumbersome. They were long-winded. The, uh, Richard Fontana could have made GPL3 shorter. I know he could have done it. Even I could have done it, but Richard couldn't do it. So we did it the long way. Because we had to be complete, because every corner case had to be handled, because no sentence could allow what we are calling ambiguity. Trust me, if, if it hadn't been for Richard Stallman, GPL3 would be a lot more ambiguous than it is, and it'd be a lot shorter. And that was the compromise we weren't allowed to make, because our client demanded of us a complete precision in the rules of sharing. The rules of sharing have paid out very nicely. We have come to a place where we can almost all agree about them. The strength of that consensus is enormous. It's going to enable a great deal of progress. It is interesting in that era of consensus that our disagreements about the modifications for additional restrictions, protections for business models, these are tiny disputes compared to the disputes we used to have. No fundamental principle is at stake in this. We have come to an agreement, and that agreement has already made many, many millions of humans love lives better, and it's going to make more, too. But we have lost, also, along the way. This is the Friday before an election. Politics matters. Nobody who lives in the United States can be unaware of the mattering of politics right now. The kinds of politics that we had, that we brought to this, that Richard had, that I had, that our friends and comrades in the movement had, the politics we had was the belief that human freedom could be eliminated by computer technology. That what we called liberty, what it meant to live in a free society, could be eliminated by computer technology if it didn't work for people. Users' rights in technology were for us a primary guarantee of the continuance of human liberty. We worried 
educated as we were in the science fiction of the 1960s, science fiction which became aware of the terrible danger of the unintended consequences of human effort because of a thing called the atomic bomb, we learned from that science fiction to fear a future in which people were slaves to computers because they could not change how computers worked because they didn't know how, because they didn't have the materials, because the machines baked society on them so tightly that there was no longer any room for liberty. That was the worry which made our careers. We have won as to how to make software, but we have not won the saving of human liberty from the technology of digital computation. On the contrary, we are just as endangered as we feared we would be when we were young. The effort to predict all human behavior based on all existing human behavior is well along. The second most powerful government on earth, that of the Communist Party of China, certainly believes that it can achieve its stated goal, which is to eliminate from human society, or at least from the society it runs, the very ideas of democracy and constitutional liberty. And Xinjiang is a testing ground for the idea that computer technology can be made to do that work. Everywhere in the developed world, we are aware that there is something sickening our politics making it harder for us to discuss and easier for us to shout. And it is, of course, that combination of witness and publication that Julia was talking about this morning, that we have democratized technology, which we meant to do, and the technology which we have democratized is threatening democracy itself. The second phase of the free software movement, in other words, is not easy going. It's not downhill sledding. It's not, I wanted to have this conference to say we won, there is consensus, now we all go home for the weekend and everything is fine. Tuesday is important. Everybody must vote. But it isn't just voting. You might have some votes in mind. You might have some issues that concern you that are particular to us. Whether, for example, governments should allow telecommunication service providers unlimited opportunities to bias the network in order to acquire more behavior data. Whether we need forms of privacy legislation around the world, not just in the United States, but in the European Union and in India, and everywhere that freedom will allow us to enact some laws for human benefit, whether we need laws about data that will help to sustain freedom. We say, Mishi and I, in the work that we are doing in India and elsewhere on such statutory development, that there is a serious problem with calling things data protection law. Because it isn't data that needs protecting, it's people that need protecting. And we're going over the next few years to discover that that question, how to protect people in data, is as complicated and as difficult as it seemed at the outset to wonder how we were going to protect users' rights in code. We figured that out. We iterated our way to it. It took an awful lot of licenses. We tried minimal, we tried maximal, we tried automatic this, and we tried discretionary that, and eventually we podged our way to some conclusions which worked, and we helped people make a ton of money, and they drove those ideas deeply into the substance of the world so deeply that they're not going to come out again. That was good. But Richard always worried that we were going to wind up with a thing he thought was open source, that was free software without the freedom. And that's not exactly what happened. But what happened was, indeed, that people got so full of technical achievement and so full of money and so full of new ways to do things that freedom took a second place. Now that we don't have to do any of that other work again, now that we will never have to defend the model of sharing over excluding, now that we will never have to say we're not a cancer, now that we can count upon everybody to understand why we believe in sharing, now we have to go back to what was in the first place the primary lesson. 
freedom is threatened by our technological prowess. The thing that we called being a human being with some privacy and some ability to resist external scrutiny or surveillance, some opportunity to keep the history of who we are from being collected by other people and used to our disadvantage, this we have now even more work to do. This is why I am not particularly concerned with the question of whether we are going to have licenses of purity or whether we are going to have perfect compliance with the rules of those licenses. These are now small matters in a hurricane. We have watched the technology that we help to make become the technology of universal behavior collection. We have instrumented the human race and we are acquiring the news about everybody all the time everywhere. One person in this room said to me today, you know, now I work at company so-and-so and we know everything about everyone. And that's right, of course. And there's something wrong with that. That's not what we came into this for. We came into this for the idea that people could compute in freedom. And we certainly thought that that meant that people could compute in ways that wouldn't kill them or hurt them that wouldn't lead to their characterization as enemies of the state or enemies of the people or enemies of peace and justice and good religion. We have a lot of work to do. I'm really glad that the first phase of the free software movement is over. I'm glad that it ended with peace and victory, both. And I am really happy that we can welcome all our former adversaries as our current friends, that there is nobody left who's opposition we have to bear. And I'm really glad that there is an election on Tuesday. And I hope you're all going to vote in that. But I'm really worried that Wednesday we will still have freedom to win. We will still have all the problems that we came into this trying to solve, still to solve. We have some wonderful tools. And we have attracted to the project tens of millions of human beings who may never have had either the opportunity or the resources to help us fight this fight. I don't mean to say that I think everybody who has ever patched a free software program is an apostle of political liberty in the way I mean it. But I can say that everybody who has ever felt free to make a change in a computer program and share that program with people whose lives might be improved by it knows one of the major benefits of freedom and may therefore be part of our comradeship in trying to make sure that the technology we have all made and which we all love is not the source of the destruction of the morals and the values which we brought to our lives. My mother in the last days of her life, in her late 70s and early 80s, became very interested in walking my beat. Her emerita lecture at the University of California, Santa Cruz in Cultural Studies, delivered in 2012, was from Frankenstein to Facebook. Last summer, when everybody started to talk about Frankenstein's monster after the Cambridge Analytica business, I, so, I told her, so now you too are part of the family. You're five years early on the iniquities of Mark Zuckerberg. But it was more than that. I'm sorry that she won't be here to read the book I'm working on because she was the primary reader and inspirer I had in writing it. But I recognize that part of the world I am mourning, the world she lived in, the world which made feminist struggle and the effort for racial justice in the United States crucial parts of her life is a world that is now, like the world of enterprise software, unbelievably more globalized and complex. We are now fighting for human freedom, not for our freedom in this country or for the freedom of people who look like us or for the people who share our history of oppression. We are concerned with whether a way of being human can survive. We made the technology which threatens to eradicate it and we did that in order to save ourselves. And now we have to live with the second order consequences of our victory. A year from now, when we are here again together, I hope, 
we will not have to worry about whether the free software model is triumphant. We will not have to worry about whether anybody has fallen out of the boat or the consensus has disappeared. But depending on the wor world we wake up in on Wednesday morning after the election, we may have to worry about the survival of freedom even more deeply than we worry about it now. I hope everybody understands that underneath all our cleverness and all our success, we face the same issue we always faced. Are we going to rule this technology or is this technology going to rule us? And that problem is one in which we all ought, on the basis of the consensus we now have, to be equally interested and equally concerned. I do not care whether proprietary software licensing survives. It's fine with me if it does. But the idea that that could be the most important question in any human being's life this, po this coming weekend seems to me wrong. The same way it seemed to me wrong when Richard Stallman and I first sat down together in the year 1993. We wanted something then, and we still want it now. We have achieved an awful lot and we are at risk of falling desperately short. I hope that everybody understands the beauty of peace, and I hope that everybody understands where the real threat to peace is. We have work to do. We'll do ours. I'm sure that you will do yours. A year from now, let us hope that we have come together in a safer and more free world. Thank you very much.